Kirchhoff wrote this book, it's about how, how the, the world of physics applies to phil philosophy and to our modern world. And he said something really important. He said, the, the way we ask our questions does a lot to define our, re our reality. The way we think our thoughts, what do you think, best of times or worst of times, that does an awful lot to frame the, the reality that you actually see. And you begin to create self-fulfilling prophecies. And so we are in the perfect storm, aren't we, in healthcare today? This is what's known as audience participation. <laughs> does it feel like the perfect storm out there? I don't know, it sort of does with, when we're visiting clients. Does it feel like pretty rocky out there? And this storm is not going to pass. And you know, you hear that, well, this, look, we've been through this before, it'll come, it'll go. This one's not going to go away. If, we, if you don't deal with it, you might go away, but the storm isn't going to go away. And what we really want is we want things to settle down. We want equilibrium, don't we? But in physics, equilibrium is a state where every force has canceled out every other force, in other words, stagnation. And what Margaret Wheatley said in another brilliant book on how to apply physics to the world of leadership, she said, disequilibrium, what we're going through now, is an essential ingredient for change. And that's, that's one of the reasons why this is not just the worst of times, this can be the best of times. Because it can galvanize us to make important changes in our organization. And chaos, if you get far enough away from it, it's a beautiful thing, isn't it? <laughs> when you're right in the middle of it, it's not so attractive. But when you get far enough away, and, and what Wheatley says, and she's right, the, more, the less willing you are to tolerate short-term chaos, the more rigid and the more structured your organization becomes, and the less able you are to cope with long-term chaos. And if you can be willing to try new things, to experiment, to go through that short-term chaos, you're going to have a much stronger, much more resilient organization. So let's do a quick reality check with two questions. One, when did the health care crisis we've been reading and hearing about, when did it begin? Was it with the Affordable Care Act? No. Uh, was it with HMOs and DRGs and all of that? No. Medicare, Medicaid, does it go back to that? No. Hill Burton? Even before that. Social Security? How about November of 1854, the day Florence Nightingale walked into the Scutari Barrack Hospital and it was literally hell on earth? She wrote home and said, this is the kingdom of hell. Mortality rate was in excess of 50%, and it was one of the most hideous healthcare environments you could imagine. But instead of throwing her hands up and saying, oh, by a healthcare crisis, she rolled up her sleeves and she went to work. And how many nurses in the room? Bless you. And you, you've heard of Florence Nightingale, haven't you? <laughs> the lady with the lamp? who more than any other person in a two-year period at the Skatari Barrack Hospital defined what it means to be a nurse. More than any other person established nursing as a real profession. She was also the first hospital administrator. And more than any other, in fact, that was her role at Skatari. More than any other person, she defined that role. Any CFOs in the room? You know who the first person ever to calculate and then reduce cost per patient day was? <laughs> Here's a hint. Yeah. Florence Nightingale. See, she understood if you want to have a compassionate organization, you also have to have an efficient organization. And too many of us in healthcare, we're, we're too focused, I think, on the left brain, you know, process improvement stuff, and we're forgetting that we have to accompany it with attitude improvement. She was the whole package. When will the healthcare crisis end? None of us get out alive, Joe. <laughs> You're so right there. <laughs> so in, in astrophysics, there's this huge mystery they're trying to understand today. And that is, where is everything? All of the formulas say there should be a whole lot more energy, there should be a whole lot more matter than what we can observe. And scientists calculate that what's called dark energy and dark matter make up all, about 96% of the universe. So what we see, the, the galaxies, the black hole, well you can't see black holes, but we know they're there in your organizations too. Um, that makes up about four, the observable universe is about 4% of what's really out there. And the same thing is true in your hospital. Uh, unseen realities dictate more than what I can see 
dictate my impression, the feelings you create for me when I walk in your hospital. Last year we visited Glen Rose Medical Center in Glen Rose, Texas. Critical access hospital, smaller community. I come in, I'm going to be there for three days. I come in at 6.30 in the morning. I've been up almost all night. I'm tired. I'm not a morning person, Michelle, I'll tell you that. I come in the front door. It's a lovely lobby. There's a fireplace, a fish tank, you know, stone wall. Lady behind the counter says, good morning, can I help you? I blink and I say, well, yeah, I'm, I'm here. To... And she says, oh, you're our speaker today, aren't you? Mr. Ty, I said, yeah. She comes around from behind the counter, takes my hand in both of hers, and she says, we are so excited to have you here. We've been looking forward to this for a long time. Can I get you something to drink? I blink again. I say, well, I'd love a Miller Lite. <laughs> <laughs> and without missing a beat, Marie, when's the last time you remembered two years later the name of the receptionist at some place you went? Without missing a beat, Marie says, well, darling, I'll see what I can do. Now, what's my lasting impression of Glen Rose Medical Center? The nice lobby, which I'm sure all of you have, or is it the fact that Marie came around from behind the counter and took my hand and made me feel special? And that's what I remember. That's the invisible architecture that we need to put every bit as much thought into as we do the bricks and the mortar. Invisible architecture determines whether you're a good hospital, a great hospital, or just another hospital.